Okay, uh, so thank you everyone for being here this late and of course like good afternoon to people online from the US and other parts of the world. Um, so I'm afraid this is going to be quite an abrupt departure from what we've heard so far as a lot of it is on health and this one is probably more on the affect side and the persuasiveness uh, side. Um, so what I want to talk about today is just uh, some key findings of our work on acoustic prosodic uh, lexical and demographic cues uh, to persuasiveness in competitive debate speeches. So I'm currently a post doctoral uh, research fellow at the University of Hamburg, and this is the joint work with uh, Raft, uh, David, Sarahita, and Julia. Uh, all of them are based in New York. So the motivation of uh, this work um, stems from the observation that um, across high-ranked careers in uh, business, um, academia, the law, or politics, what we've seen um, in all of these careers um, is essentially uh, two common facts. Now, first of all, we see that there is a uh, persistent underrepresentation of women across all of these careers. The second thing that they also have in common is that, as you might know, mastering the art of persuasion is crucial to advancement in these high-level careers. So be it persuading jury in front of the courtroom, negotiating a business trade deal, or presenting your findings at conferences, your ability to communicate uh, what's on your agenda clearly and coherently to uh, audience in the room is crucial to advancement um, in any positions across these careers. So uh, what we do effectively um, in this work is essentially uh, trying to understand how do different spoken persuasion tactics predict persuasiveness across genders. Um, and the reason why um, this research could uh, help uh, you know, adding to a substantial contribution in this respect is that um, what I've done so far is that I can analyze the acoustic, prosodic, and lexical correlates of persuasiveness um, in over 674 like, highest profile university debate uh, tournament speeches, taking into account speaker, judge, uh, and debate characteristics. Now, the reason why it is an interesting setting is that it comes from um, the real life high stack debate competitions. So these are the world universities, Euro European universities debate championship, as well as the world uh, champion league where they invite top teams across the world um, to compete with one another. Okay, so um, here I'm just going to outline some uh, further three key advantages of why debate tournaments offers quite um, a unique setup for us to study uh, persuasiveness across genders. So first of all, it offers a standardized format that is a British parliamentary debate style. Um, and for those who don't know, it's essentially um, the format that is used widely across the world in public speaking and critical thinking uh, training, um, you know, in civic education uh, in most Western countries. So the second thing that is crucial is that it uses a transparent and consistent evaluation criteria. So the grading scale is from 50 to 100, and this score is the thing that then I'm going to use as, say, the persuasiveness uh, measure you know, across speakers. Um, and this is purely based on argumentation comparative strength. That is to say, things that you often see um, that is common in political debates or courtroom speeches, for instance, um, you know, personal character attacks, um, ad hominem uh, argumentation strategies, all of these things are completely outlaw um, in debate competitions. The last thing is that it also randomly um, allocates you know, the speaking topic, the position you're speaking for or against in the front or the back half of a debate, as well as the opponents uh, you're facing and the judges who evaluate uh, your speeches. So all of these are exogenously assigned to you. So in that respect, what that means is that comparing to cases, say, like in political debates, where you would have people with um, you know, personal beliefs, as well as background agreements that are completely unobserved to researchers, this is not the case, let's say, you know, in debate competitions. So what you're observing is technically a measure of persuasiveness in a strategically relevant real-life competitive context. And it also gives us chance for us to understand the existence and magnitude of discrimination. So in this specific context, I study about genders, uh, but of course I have data also on whether a speaker is a non-native speaker or whether they're representing, you know, like top-ranked institutions, so to say. So this is also some dimensions that we can investigate like further um, in later work. <clears throat> 
Okay, so um, this is just some uh, sketching of the related work um, that we have for this uh, paper. So um, because we use a multimodal analysis, um, we then relate to work um, on like charisma, likability, personality, and trust detection. So for instance, uh, most recent work by Yang um, and colleagues in 2020, they show that persuasiveness ratings correlate strongly with charisma ratings, and especially along the um, gender dimensions. Um, the closest work that I would say like to our paper, um, it's two work that are built on say creating a virtual debate coach uh, for young politicians. So in this case by Petukova, Ma Malkano, and Abunt in 2017. And the other work is um, just working on the Oxford um, debates. So these are like around uh, 30 debaters like on average. Um, and of course, like some of you might have heard it from the news, like about how IBM created like a project debater that's trying to debate directly like with a world class uh, debate champion. Um, so this is also like you know one of the very close work to us. And um, of course, most and if not all of their data is essentially lab based environment, right? So they invite uh, professional debaters over, they give them you know a topic, and then they just have to essentially give a speech according to the criteria. But there's basically no, say, like real life component of being competitive, of being like in high stack where you're actually having to compete with other people and you're discussing across a wide range of topics, um, you know, and judged by people you might not know across the world. And the other thing is, of course, like there's no clear transparent evaluation criteria in this case, right? So it's just expert, you know, debaters coming over, so to say. So what that means is that um, what we can contribute is a multimodal analysis on real life, uh, you know, high stake debate tournament corpus with expert human score speech evaluations. And on top of that, we have a lot of say, uh, paralinguistic data about not only the speakers, but also the judges in the debate, which adds a lot of like richness um, to the analysis. Okay, so here you can see um, an overview of how the data is collected um, and how features are extracted from both the um, lexical side as well as from the acoustic prosodic side. So um, from 2008 to 2018, um, I run across all the YouTube videos um, of the World European Debate Championships. And then I collect, I think, like around like 225 hours of uh, YouTube videos. Um, now, after some um, extensive cleaning and checking, you know, like uh, in audible data and so to say. So we ended up with like 168 hours that are usable uh, for the transcripts and for the audio. Um, so from the transcript side, um, I've just then, after all the cleaning, extracted the uh, persuasion relevant linguistic inquiry word counts. Uh, for instance, you know, fillers, uh, hedging language, uh, certainty indicators, uncertainty indicators that one have in their speech, as well as, you know, the complex vocabulary. Um, and on top of that is the debate uh, question and answer strategies that are specific to this format. Now on the audio side, um, then the Columbia Speech Lab uh, step in. So what uh, we do together is essentially, you know, just use a parcel mouse, so a common um, interface of a Pratt and Pyanote. Um, and there we just extract the five most commonly studied um, speech uh, features. So um, intensity, uh, pitch, um, harmonic to void, noise uh, ratio, uh, jitter, and shimmer. So what we do with this is that we sample 100 times uh, per second, and then uh, in order to reduce the um, dimensionalities of, you know, of the data, we pick uh, just five quantiles for pitch and intensity. Okay, so after that, uh, with the acoustic and prosodic cues, we also then set score normalized uh, by gender, um, and then in the end, what we end up so far, like in this paper at least, is 475 um, speeches given by men and 199 uh, speeches given by women. Now the second part um, is just to show you the procedure of where I web scrap the data, let's say, you know, on the speaker motion, um, the gender, the evaluation scores that they have, whether they are native language speakers, um, whom are they speaking with in the tournament, um, the judges, and the institutions that they represent and which country they come from. Okay, so, um, Essentially speaking, in this uh, specific paper, we want to predict the speech evaluation scores given the extracted acoustic, prosodic, lexical, and demographic features 
right? Um, so in the first most simple step of this paper, we just run the tenfold cross-validation experiments with linear uh, lasso rich and random forest regressions in order to check for the most predictive model. So we just check, you know, for mean and standard deviation R square um, on acoustic prosodic lexical part, demographic features, and then a combined model, uh, you know, pairwise as well as all together. Um, for first all the speeches and then for male and female speeches um, separately. So what do we have? So this table provides an overview of the most predictive features um, for the entire data set um, across different models. So what you can see is that um, for the raw and gender normalized acoustic prosodic, what matters the most is um, effectively just intensity and pitch. Um, somewhat difference in terms of what kind of things matters. Um, we're saying, you know, like uh, maybe the percentile difference between 60th and 80th percentile of the pitch, um, mean intensity, uh, et cetera. But anything else like harmonic to ball and noise ratio, uh, chitter and shimmer don't really matter. For the uh, lexical part, then we see that um, the characters per word, so how complex your vocabulary is, uh, uh, percentage of now, um, as well as uh, fillers and hatches matter uh, quite significantly uh, for the speakers. And if you actually take a look at the mean R square, across all the models, um, the um, standalone model of lexical one predicts the best in terms of persuasiveness. Now, um, the next bad one is the uh, demographic, right? So what we can see here is that um, whether a panel is female dominated really matters uh, for the pre predicting the predict, um, predictiveness scores of the speaker. Uh, whether a speaker is non-native, uh, whether they are highly ranked, like so they, if they represent like the top 50 universities in the world, um, and the ratio of female uh, judges in the panel. So all of these things matter significantly uh, to predicting uh, persuasiveness. Now, um, what we managed to achieve so far with these um, 674 speeches is that with a combined model between lexical and demographic, we got the predictive performance of mean R square of 0 0.4. Um, and these are the five top most uh, predictive features. So you can see again, like institution ranking, um, hedges, um, character count, fillers. So these things uh, matters the most for predicting persuasiveness. Okay, um, and this is just a breakdown between um, male versus female in terms of like what's most predictive for men versus women. Um, so what we can see here is that for acoustic prosodic, again, same thing, only pitch and intensity matter uh, differently for men and women. For lexical one, um, the blue one represents essentially things that matter for men, um, and the only thing that matter for women is whether or not they have more certain language in their speeches. Um, and the more certain their language they have in their speeches, the more persuasive the judges find uh, their speeches to be. Um, for demographic, again, judge gender composition matter, but only for men. Um, for women, then whether a room have more female competitors in it uh, matter, but actually negatively for their performance. Um, and last but not least, like on the combined uh, version, we see again like how complex vocabulary uh, really matters uh, positively uh, for um, persuasiveness and, and uh, negatively for fillers. However, like one word of caution is that for um, the combined model as well as for acoustic prosodic uh, features, what we notice is that uh, the performance for the female only uh, speeches uh, is significantly worse. This is not necessarily because of the sample, right? So the sample size for the female is around 200 uh, speeches. For male is 475 speeches. Uh, when we randomly sample also the speeches given by men for 200, we get pretty much a similar performance uh, as the mean R square of 0 0.3, but for women it's just uh, bad. So it is my suggesting that there's some differential standards in terms of like how judges um, evaluate speeches given by women. Okay, um, so just to conclude, um, so far what we presented is a lexical fit demographic, uh, you know, linear regression model in our 674 uh, real-life high-stake uh, debate tournament speech corpus. Um, 
And we need to do some further investigation on female speeches to conclude which speech elements are perceived as uh, persuasive uh, by judges. Um, so, so far, what we've done is that we've extracted more um, acoustic features. Um, so right now, we achieved to, you know, like 842 speeches. Um, and the mean R square has increased to 0 0.46, but it's not like that much better, even after we've been denoising and doing a lot of other things. So we're thinking like next steps, we can also include like facial um, expressions, syntactic complexity, as well as some argument level component of uh, speeches to improve our model performance. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please, any questions appreciated right now, as well as sending me email later. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, we have one question. Uh, yeah, please come. <coughs> So hi, I think it was your paper with your per persuasive voice you presented <laughs> this paper, <laughs> but <laughs> that's true. Uh, uh, what I didn't understand, why uh, is there a difference between persuasive speech and charismatic speech? Because I was reading a paper uh, that was related to charisma in business speeches that compare a Steve Jobs uh, voice with uh, Mark Zuckerberg. And now I, I couldn't understand uh, why you, it was a matter of choice that you use persuasive for the, your project, or are they different? Um, so I think um, charisma is potentially part of it, but it's not necessarily a whole big picture of it, right? Whereas like, I think you, uh, you probably need to um, disentangle between the context because the, the business context in terms of charisma is very different on say, you know, what is considered as persuasive in debate competitions. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas like in this context, what we mean when it's persuasive, that means that you present a coherent, clear, comparative argument against the opponents that you have. Um, so in that respect, it focus, I guess, more on the logos part of your speech other than, let's say, you know, like charisma, I guess, is focused a little bit more on the, the ethos, um, you know, the, the feeling of how you have towards um, a speech, right? Okay, then yeah. I have another question regarding that. It means that with a persuasive voice, we have charismatic voice also. Um, I, I, I have not really checked that, let's say, you know, okay. in this, um, say, paper, right? Besides, I mean, the scores that they receive is purely from the judges on the basis of this comparative argumentation strength that they have. In order to say whether this is actually also strongly correlated with charisma, I guess we would then need to hire, I guess, like m turkers to check out different types sure. of, you know, charisma ratings and such like, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We, we haven't received any any online questions? Yes, we have one more question from the audience. Two more. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Congratulations on your work. My question is regarding um, uh, interjudge variability. Do you have this kind of um, of information? Uh, if um, uh, like more than one judge just judge the same uh, score the same the same speech and what's the, this if you have this variability information and if you do uh, did you perform any analysis on the gender of the judge uh, not only the gender the gender of the speaker yeah uh, so thanks a lot for the clarification um, so the speech score that people receive it's actually just one score Mm -hmm. um, and of course it is a panel of say three to five judges and there would be one chair judges um, and then their wing judges you know they're all doing the same task and then they just deliberate 15 minutes after the mm -hmm. debate to reach a unanimous decision so the score that we see is the only score that they have so unfortunately you know it would be great to have all these individual parts of it um, and yeah, so on your second part of whether I analyze also the gender dynamics of the judge panels, like in terms of the score, um, yes, I do. Um, it is a separate 
uh, economic paper. So where I look at the data set of say, you know, around 40,000 speech scores across all scores um, um, in the past. Uh, and there I actually see that if you have a female judge as a chair of your debate, whether or not you're men or women, you're just less likely to get higher score comparing to those who get a male chair judge. Mm -hmm. um, and that holds, especially if you are, let's say, you know, in a higher ranked debate, and, you know, because these tournaments, they power much good teams with one another. So in that respect, having a female uh, judge does not necessarily increase or improve the chances of success like, as a woman. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And congratulations Thanks. again. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, no, it works. Yeah, it works. Um, yeah, I think my question was aiming in a similar direction, and maybe you answered it already partially or fully. It uh, would be also for the target that you use, like this target score, because coming a bit from this um, computational paralinguistics perspective, from my understanding, what you, um, yeah, like uh, accumulate with this score for the speaker is also like the content, or like it's also heavily supposed to be based on the content right what you said like the um uh, the judges are supposed to rate how really like persuasive also from um yeah the speech content it was and not only or like probably not too much emphasis should be put on um on how persuasive the sound of the voice was so is that um or like is this general score composed of different sub scores that the judges come up in some together and um if it's really about the content it might be quite interesting also like to look at the um, textual features only I, I just see there yeah so uh, you're absolutely right that um, in an ideal world the goal is just to focus on the content of the speech right mm -hmm. um, and therefore I think this is like I'm doing a bit of like a reverse analysis right so assuming these are the rules of the game first I'm looking at the content of the speech on the lexical uh, parts I'm gonna see whether or not these are the things that matter like the most and then next, I'm checking the acoustic prosodic parts of the speech. Um, and as you can see with the data so far, what matters the most is um, the lexical parts. Um, now, of course, we have not yet been able to check the um, argumentation level of the speech. Um, so I hope that this would be, you know, like, you know, the one that improves the model massively. Um, but say, you know, we add also different kinds of features of the acoustic prosodic, um, you know, lexicals and such like, but the acoustic prosodic model really doesn't improve much. A combined model with acoustic one actually performs form worse than say just the demographic and the lexical one yeah yeah thanks uh, I mean this is yeah quite interesting to see how this one score is composed of both yeah. factors and then you have more success of course on the lexical part of it yeah yeah thanks okay thank you very much uh, are there any more questions Okay, then I think we can close the session. Thanks for everybody for being here.